Hi, this is Dean Miller back with another video of the significance of the life of Jesus. This is in Matthew chapter 23, verses 13 through 36. Jesus condemns the religious leaders. In the NIV, it's called the seven woes on the teachers of law and the Pharisees. And I'm going to read out of the NLT Bible. What sorrows await you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees? Hypocrites, for you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You won't go in yourselves. And you don't let others enter either. What sorrows awaits you, teachers of religious laws, and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cross the land and the sea to make one convert, and then you turn that person into twice a child of hell you yourselves are. Blind guides, what sorrows await you, for you say that it means nothing to swear by God's temple, but it is binding to swear by the gold in the temple. Blind fools, which is more important, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? And you say that you, to swear by the altar is not binding, but swear by the gifts on the altar is binding. How blind, for which you are more important, the gifts on the altar or the altar that makes the gifts sacred. When you swear by the altar, you are swearing by it and everything on it. When you swear by the temple, you are swearing on it by, swearing on it and by God who lives in it. And when you swear by heaven, you are swearing by the throne of God and by the God who sits on the throne. What sorrows await you teachers of religious laws and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the important things, blind guides. You strain your water so that you accidentally swallow a gnat, so you don't accidentally swallow a gnat, but you swallow a camel. So, Earlier in this chapter, Jesus calls out the religious leaders publicly. Now you see him have a more private conversation with them. And he's pretty harsh on them here. Being a religious leader was different in Jerusalem back in those days than being a pastor in today's age. Israel's history, culture, and daily life centered around the relationships with God. The religious leaders were best known, most powerful, and the most respected leaders. Jesus made these stinging accusations because the leaders hunger for more power, money, and status had made them lose sight of God. And their blindness was spreading to the whole nation. So what it was is they got comfortable in their lives and they were more about themselves and making money than spreading the word of God. Kind of like you see in these big churches today. It's all about the theatrics and the shows and the mu music videos and that. It's all about making money. So I'm going to break this section down into two videos. Because there's so much information here. And I want to keep them short. So there are seven sorrows or woes Jesus issues to the religious leaders. And in this video we're going to go over the first four woes or sorrows. And in the next video we'll go over the last three. So a woe is used in scripture as either an expression of grief or judgment. Here Jesus uses a woe or a sorrow as an expression of righteous anger and a pronunciation of impeding judgment. So Jesus himself is the judge who will judge every person. So verse 14, for, verse 14 is the first sorrow or the woe. And I'm going to read it. It says, What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees? Hypocrites, for you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You won't go in yourselves and you don't let others enter either. So here is a dose of sin among the worst possible. Willful rebellion and dragging others down as well. Not letting others enter the kingdom of heaven and not entering yourselves. So the hypocrisy and failure to experience the truth is that they were slamming the door of the kingdom in the faces of people seeking God. Jesus was implying that the Jewish leaders used every opportunity to keep people out of the kingdom and to keep the door permanently closed. They were misguiding the people who were seeking God's kingdom and who were trying to enter his kingdom. They did this by their own example. Jesus said, you won't go yourselves, and they don't let others go either. They led evil lives, and the people followed them. Here we see the zealous protectiveness of God's shepherd for his sheep. So these they were just living lives that weren't following scriptures. Like you see people today, they're hypocrites. They say one thing and do another. And they were teaching other people to do 
the wrong things and we'll get into it more in the rest of these verses here so verse 14 this is verses left out of some manuscripts and it's in uh, the King James Version but it would read what sorrows await you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees hypocrites you shamelessly cheat widows out of their property and then you pretend to be pious by making long prayers in public because of this you will be severely punished some man like I said some manuscripts leave this verse out so the Pharisees would cheat out and take advantage of widows. They would tell them that if they invest in their religion or give for the cause, there would be a special place in heaven for them. Just like these funeral parlors do with these people who died today. You know, they'll tell you, hey, you want your loved one to be comfortable. Spend an extra 10000 on this casket that's going to be wider. Which it doesn't make a difference because it's just a body in there and, and you don't care if you're comfortable if you're dead. So that's what they're doing with these widows. They're exploiting them for their money. And then they would make loud, loud prayers in public to get the applause of men and make them look holier than thou. So they'd pray long prayers and, and stand there and pray forever. And then everybody would say, look, look at that guy over there. He's, he's holier than we are because he can pray better and louder than we can. And this is the exact opposite of what Jesus stood for. Jesus didn't ask for anything. Jesus didn't exploit anybody. Jesus didn't ever ask for money. He didn't have a place to stay. He went where he, people let him lay his head. Jesus also didn't pray loudly for show or to make himself look more holy. Everything Jesus did was for the glory of his Father in heaven and to fulfill his will. So verse 15 says, What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious laws and you Pharisees? Hypocrites, for you cross the land and sea to make one convert, and then you turn that person into twice the child of hell that you yourself are. So the second, this is the second sorrow or woe. Converting people away from God to be like yourself. They would travel across the world, across the land and sea, for only one to convert. A convert was a Gentile who was one who has won the faith of Yahu, Yahi, the God of Israel. So, but this convert would have been better off if he didn't convert to Judaism. Because Judaism didn't believe in Jesus. They believed that you had to be, your good deeds would get you to heaven. So this convert would surpass his teacher in hypo hypocrisy and evil and result in a, them to receive a harsher judgment. This convert was convinced that he was following God, but he was actually following Satan. God intended Israel to be his ambassadors to the world to bring people to him. But Israel, but the leaders of Israel were leading people into rebellion by refusing the prophets and killing the only path to heaven, and that was Jesus. They killed the prophets, they killed the messengers, and they killed the Son of God, Jesus. People were attracted to the religion and not to God. There's a lot of religions out there like that today, that people go there for the religion and not for, the, for Jesus. The church is for Jesus. The additional laws and traditions miss the point God intended them to be. The religion of works puts pressure on people, and faith is the key to heaven, not good works. So a lot of people say, well, if you're a good person and you do good deeds, you're going to go to heaven. And that's not true. To go to heaven is there's only one way, and that's through, the, through Jesus Christ. Then verses 16 through 22 is the third woe, or terror. So he says, blind guides, what sorrows await you? For you say that it means nothing to swear by God's temple, but that is binding to swear by the gold in the temple. Blind fools, which is more important, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? And you say to swear by the altar is not binding, but to swear by the gifts on the altar is binding. How blind for which you are, which is more important, the gift on the altar or the altar that makes the gift sacred? When you swear by the altar, you are swearing by it, and everything on it. And when you swear by the temple, you are swearing by it and by God who lives in it. And when you swear by heaven, you are swearing by the throne of God and by God who sits on the throne. So this third woe is perverting God's law. It's blindly leading people to follow man-made traditions instead of God's word. These religious leaders were good at making laws that were better than God's laws. Why would God put out a law and want a man to make his law better so how people this is how people rationalize their own sin 
This is the only woe or terror that doesn't begin with the formula address. Teachers of religious laws and you Pharisees, you hypocrites. Jesus calls them blind guides because of their ability to mislead the people. They taught man-made perversions of the law of God and then taught this man-made perversion to people and made them believe that it was from God. So they were tricking people thinking that God was the one that made these laws, but they were the ones that made them. These leaders were blinded by their hard hearts and they were guiding others to be the same way. So Jesus provides two ways that hypocrites used oaths to get away with lying. The first one was swearing by the temple, calling upon the God who dwelt there to curse the promise maker if he should fail to keep the promise. It's like a person saying, I swear to God. I swear to God this is what happened. But when the hypocrite would come to fulfill the promise, he would claim that the oath was not binding since he did not specify the gold in the treasury, temple treasury. So it's kind of like standing there with your fingers behind your back and telling a lie and say it didn't matter because you had your fingers crossed. These are what, kind of what they were doing. So the wealth of the temple gave it the significance, not the God in it. So that's what they were saying, that the, the gold was more important than, the God, than the, the God in the temple. They never intended to keep these promises, and it made God angry that to misuse these oaths. Because it was God's name that was brought into the seal of approval. And like I was saying earlier, how many people do you hear say, I swear to God, I swear to God it happened. If you don't lie all the time or tell a lot of lies, you'll never have to say, I swear to God, because people will believe you. But if you keep telling lies, then you have to say that for somebody to believe some of the things that you say. It's kind of like using God's name in vain in the third commandment. Jesus then calls them blind fools because by swearing by the temple, it, misused, it missed the purpose of the temple. It was not the gold in the temple that gave the temple its significance. Rather, it's God's presence that gave the gold its special significance, setting it apart from any other gold in the world because it's God's gold. God owns everything. This is kind of like legalism or morally bankrupt, like our culture. We have the truth, we have the semi-truth, and then the true truth. The true truth. Society today has made a mockery of truth and character. And you can see that on the news every day. And they don't even tell the truth anymore. It's just a mockery. And in the second example, Jesus accused the, the hypocrites of claiming an oath by the altar to be invalid because their oath did not specify the gift on the altar. So the altar was a table that things were to be sacrificed on in the acts of worship. These arrogant hypocrites believed their gifts could be more could give more significance to God's altar. So they thought that their gifts were more important than God's altar. So once again Jesus calls them blind fools. They failed to recognize that no offering from a sinful purpose could give significance to God's offer. So if you're if you're given a if you're sacrificing something with a sinful purpose then that's not going to give no significance. Rather, the sacred altar in God's temple made the offering sacred and acceptable to God. So it's God that makes it acceptable. We are not the source of things acceptable to God. Anything we give God is only given back what he has already provided for us. And that gets us to verses 20 to 22. It says, When you swear by the altar, you're swearing by it and everything on it. When you swear by the temple, you're swearing by it. And by God who lives in it, and you swear by heaven, you are swearing by the throne of God, and by God who sits on the throne. So Jesus corrected the mistaken thinking behind the woeful oaths, the wrongful oaths, by providing three examples of right misunderstanding. The first example is an oath by the altar, for it calls upon the holiness of God's altar and a sanctified sacrifice upon it. Jesus is not telling us to stop making oaths but to keep our word by saying what we mean and mean what we say. Some people would swear to the temple. Same thing, it calls on the holiness of God's temple and the one who dwells in it. Some would fear falsely by heaven, would swear falsely by heaven and not keep their vows. Jesus clarifies that swearing by heaven calls upon the holiness and the authority of God's throne and God himself who sits on it. So bottom line is don't swear to the altar. Don't swear to the temple. Don't swear to heaven. Don't swear to God. Don't swear to earth or anything that relates to God. Don't make any promises you can't or are not going to keep. Don't do this. It makes God angry. Then verses 23 through 24 says, 
What sorrows await you teachers of religious laws and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens. But now you ignore the most important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe, yes. Do not neglect the important things. Blind guides, you strain your water so you wouldn't actually swallow a gnat, but you swallow a camel. So this is the fourth woe, or sorrow. And this is involving yourself in every last detail and ignoring what really what was really important. Justice, mercy, and faith. That's the thing that's important to God. So this is, this is like sorrow number three, how the Jewish leaders had perverted God's law to allow them to disobey, disobey its true intent. These hypocrites tithe. They gave 10% of everything down to the little herbs in their pantries. And the NIV says mint, dill, and cumin. So they were so important on the details of tithing, but they didn't have the right understanding behind it. They didn't have the right motivations behind this tithing. And like I said, Jesus isn't condemning the tithing, but it's a smokescreen. It distracted people from noticing that they had neglected the most important aspects of the law, just like mercy, justice, and faith. They didn't show mercy on people. They blamed them for everything. They didn't show justice and also faith. That's the three things that they denied Jesus. They denied Jesus any kind of mercy. They denied him justice when they sent him to the cross. And they didn't have faith in him. They were guilty of committing injustice and acting unmercifully at the expense of others and their own profit. They should have given greater attention to these more important matters of the law while also giving attention to their tithing and other requirements. Jesus quotes in Matthew 9, 13, it says, I want to show mercy... I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. What good is sacrifice if you don't show compassion and mercy to others? We can make great sacrifices, but not lifting a finger to help one another. Tithing is important to God, but giving tithes does not exempt us from fulfilling other directives, and tithing isn't going to buy us into heaven. Once again, Jesus calls them blind guides. Back in the day, they would strain their wine, and keep the insects out of their drinks so they wouldn't take in anything unpure. Swallowing these gnats was unclean according to the laws of Moses. They paid close attention to the details of the laws, but lacked the perspective of inner purity. So they were more worried about being clean on the outside than what they were internally. They would swallow a camel and not even know it. So they were worried about this tiny, small gnat and being clean on the outside, but they were swallowing a huge camel in the process. Which re represents their, their corrupt hearts that they had on the inside. They were worrying about something so small, but they were overlooking the big thing. Mercy, faith, and compassion. They looked apart, but failed to live up to the standards of the laws. And would look down on people, causing them to teach others to do the same thing. And I'm going to stop there, and next week we're going to go over the last three woes. So, thank you for listening to my videos. Please subscribe to my channel on YouTube. Please comment in the comment section. And please share these videos because I do this all for the glory of God. And I hope everyone had a good 4th of July and everyone have a blessed week. And I look forward to doing the next part of this video next week. Thank you for listening. Amen.